Hey there, my name is Corey Richards. Uh, I was a National Geographic photographer for about 15 years, and I climbed professionally for the same amount of time, almost 20 years. And my climbing career was actually my entree into to photography and National Geographic. But it was something that I learned from a very young age. I started climbing when I was about five years old because my parents were climbers and skiers, and that was something we did in the summertime. And so it was always part of, uh, it was part of my upbringing. It was very much a part of my identity for a long time. And I had a deep, deep love for it. And then as I did it professionally, it started to take on a different tone. It started to change. And I, I loved it the entire time, but it also had a different quality that ultimately led me to give it up. Um, but at the time, at the height of it, I was doing mostly Himalayan climbing and I was, um, I went to Everest in 2016 to climb it without oxygen. And so I'm going to read a little bit from the book, uh, and then talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> An hour later, I approached the legs of a lifeless body hanging upside down in a tangle of rope. Tufts of loose feathers pushed through the torn suit, fluttering. I think of Marco and Daria in Peru and the little girl who pushed me and my camera further into this life. I think of all the friends and people I've known who no longer are and lose count because my brain is too slow. I think of all the bodies I've seen on this climb and all the others in various states of decomposition and wonder again at matter changing form. I don't know how much time passes between this and the moment I sit down on the summit. An hour? Two? When I take the final step, there is nothing and no one, and literally everything on the earth is below me. I reach as high as I can and touch space. There's no place left to go. In some fundamental way, I've exhausted the search outside of myself for anything that might make me whole. But I can't see this now. For seven minutes, I sit in silence, and my awkward mind is literally the highest point on the planet. So that was 2016, that's summiting Everest without oxygen. Uh, my partner had turned around early in the morning, so I was climbing alone. And it was one of those days that doesn't look like we see on the news where there's a lineup of brightly colored people. I was the only person on the summit that day, or for the time that I was on the summit. Um, and it's really interesting because I look back now and I see that experience so differently than I did at the time. At the time, it was this accomplishment. And I had always viewed mountains in a very specific way. Mountains occupy a very special place in the human mind because they represent something that is both uh, metaphorical for the struggles of life but also throughout history, throughout mythology, mountains represent sort of the, the, the home of divinity, of spirituality. And I am not a religious person, but I was always excited by that mystery. I was excited by the idea of this union as close as you could get with the unknowable. Because mountains, in a very real way, are the end of the knowable earth right? And especially Everest. It's not the hardest mountain to climb. It's not the most dangerous. Climbing without oxygen, yes, it's, that's more difficult and far more dangerous. But what Everest represents in the human mind is less about the accomplishment of climbing, but more about the end of the knowable planet. And from that point forward, from that point up, everything else is, is solid. And yet from that point up, it's all a mystery. And interestingly, as much as that was an accomplishment and as much as I had used climbing to understand myself and learn things from it, and I did it for you know almost two decades, climbing these mountains harder and harder and harder mountains, higher and higher and higher mountains, but I started to realize that the lessons I was learning were all the same. So the value in it started to diminish, at least from a personal internal education standpoint, I was repeating, I was recycling the same thing over and over and over, hoping that it would bring me something new. 
And in hindsight, I see it now as, especially as it relates to my mental health, I was searching outside of myself to resolve internal struggles. And this is actually something that's fundamental about storytelling. We often mistake an internal journey for an external goal. And that's actually where story happens. Story is not about what happens outside of us. It's about what's happening inside of us. So if we repeat the same thing over and over and over again, we stop learning. And I look back now and I think of that moment and as beautiful as it was, as, as, as uh, fulfilling as it was, I also see that that was the end of my path with climbing because there was nothing else I could do. I had climbed to the highest point on the planet in the hardest way possible. And yet I couldn't get away from that discomfort in myself. And I realized at the time that, you know, we always hear the summit doesn't matter. It's the journey. And that's so ironic because I agree, but it's only the summit that can illuminate its own insignificance.